Hello, my name's Leslie Atherton and this is my fairly strange short story called Green Felted Swirl. The 35th birthday party had been long awaited. June, the occasion's guest of honour, had dressed for the role and her green felted swirl hat lifted her whole appearance from the ordinary to the extraordinary. There was something about her, something that neither of us could put a label on at the time. Max described it later as a bored nonchalance, like that of a catwalk model, all pouty and tall. Personally, I classed it as pretentiousness. I call her June, as that's how I knew her from our school days. She was just a normal girl back then. We both were. But war changes people as much as it changes landscapes. So parts of our hometown were no more, and this woman wasn't June anymore. She was Rowena. Rowena in her green felted swirl of a hat. Her hands were clenched around a small velvet bag in the same shade of green. The contents would be esoteric, no doubt, and would plunge our own spiritual consciousness into a chasm from which she would never allow us to recover. You see, June, uh, sorry, Rowena, try as I might to call her by that new name, to me she will always be June, had an incredible ability to make those around her feel utterly useless and inadequate. The fact that she wore a spectacular hand-sculpted headpiece meant that all the party-goers removed their own hats. She made pronouncements of such astonishing wisdom that no one else trusted their own judgments as a result. She would expound this wisdom in such a way that it became indisputable, the word of a greater being existing at the height of perfection. Our entire friendship group were enraptured by every word she said. Max and I were the exceptions, but still we listened. Enticed, charmed and bewitched, we could do nothing else, so it didn't stop us hating her. We hated that she got everything right. When the rest of us struggled to make sense of life, we hated that everything came so easily to her. We mainly hated that face and the expression it took on when she couldn't help herself from being wonderful. Patronising, devious, smug and pretentious, I hated her. See this, this bag, this small velvet bag. It belongs to June, Rowena. I stole it, and I'm glad I did. She never guessed that I was the one who'd taken it, and now that's something, one thing only, that I have over her. Thing is, I'm not sure what to do with it now. <clears throat> the thing is, I'm not sure what to do with it now. I've not even opened it yet. I could open it and lose the contents, then give it back to her, all sad-faced, and say, Oh my God, I found this on the floor, empty, and I recognised it as yours. I really was tempted, but that wasn't what I did. Instead, I threw the far too wonderful woman's pouch into the river. I put my erratic behaviour down to the stresses of war. The conflict had previously confined itself to our country's shorelines and central cities, but as June effortlessly transformed into Rowena, the war transformed too, moving towards suburbia to usually sleepy town centres and down avenues and crescents. Nowhere was safe. Nobody was safe. The war raged outside the front of our homes as troops ran through the streets, shouting dirty and chaotic. With so much fear, smoke and noise, poisonous gases and general aggression in the air, how could anyone feel safe? How could anyone even leave their homes? Though the streets do bear many signs of war, our home's interiors haven't changed much. Once the doors are closed, our home is as well-maintained, spacious and attractive as the war will allow, with the exception of our unusual kitchen. There's no reason why, but the oven has been placed on top of the worktops, with no explanation from the landlord. It works as a fuel-saving measure, as it renders the hobs completely unusable. Also, the landlord thought it a good idea to install a shower cubicle in the very centre of our large living room. I've never seen anything like it. But on the plus side, the place is warm and airy, and these little idiosyncrasies just add to its charm. The war is everywhere, and there's no escape. But there are positives to living here. The conservatory is sunny, and inside I've placed furniture, soft furnishings, sofa tables, drapes and plants in an asymmetrical fashion. It is beautiful, and the little 1930s in its elegant geometric style. 
yet it is homely too. June, Rowena, hadn't agreed during her unexpected and unwelcome visit to her home. She'd complained of feeling stifled in the clutter. Her visit had been under the pretext of collecting our signatures for her latest anti-war petition, and she shared a glass of vodka with me in the conservatory. On sitting down, she immediately demanded that I should cut back the potted pine tree I'd owned since the age of twenty. It started its life with me as a terrarium plant, and ended up eight feet high. Without its yearly trim, it would have burst through the ceiling. Yes, she was unpleasant. Yes, she hated what Max and I had as a couple, and I know she was lonely and dissatisfied too. But still, I wish I hadn't thrown her bag into the river. I don't know why I took it, and can still see her confusion. Where was her bag? Who would want to take it? Even I couldn't answer truthfully, because I didn't know myself. Was the theft perhaps some form of revenge? It was peaceful in my comfortable home, surrounded by the complex simplicity of a suburbia framed by rolling hills, woodland and lake, all green and absolutely stunning. There isn't even a sign of the war out front, and no smoke either today. I, like every person here, am regularly tempted to go outside, but I know I won't. Things change so speedily. Soon we wouldn't be able to pretend the war didn't exist, as we'd be right at the epicentre of this unavoidable crap. And I was terrified at the prospect. The streets were always empty nowadays, an unofficial curfew controlling our movements. It was rare for anyone to go out, and only the most bohemian would hold a party. But earlier that day, Max and I had searched for the venue of Marina's birthday party, trudging through suburban street after suburban street, eventually getting so far from the destination that we'd had to flag down a taxi, spending money we really didn't have. But it was worth it to get away from the part of the city we'd always avoided. We were already mentally bruised and battered by the time Rowena's green felted swirl of a hat had come into view. So for us, the party was already spoiled. It wasn't only the party. Everything was spoiled. Life, so different without working mobile phone masts, was disjointed, and those living it were powerless. Only a few years ago, it was simple to check out restaurants, directions, and the movements of friends. Plans could be changed in an instant. We thrived on the immediacy of it, the flexibility and fun. Now... Our ageing phones are less than useless, the internet accessible only to the military. Many of our friends have been coerced into the war effort. Beryl, Marina's mum, a quite nondescript 60-year-old with an innocent round face and perpetually puzzled expression, told us it was easy to move round the war zone, provided you were a middle-aged and therefore invisible woman. I tried to leave the house alone to prove that I, as a younger woman, not nondescript nor invisible, would have the nerve to walk around my own city, but the gases held me back, as did my fear. Rowena boasted that she'd travelled to the party, without fuss and without snow, on a slalom bobsleigh. Her lies were becoming less the fantasies that they'd started off as, and more elaborately constructed madness designed to confuse and obfuscate the real Rowena, who was in turn the real June. The lies convinced some, but why lie? Life was confusing and unpleasant enough nowadays. Why would she dress up as if attending a permanent cocktail party at a stately home? Dressing up while everyone around her was dressing down seemed more than a rebellion or symbol of wealth and I'm not letting this war touch me. Every other citizen was forced into austerity measures, but they didn't seem to apply to Rowena, who, if anything, appeared wealthier and smarmier than ever before. Max had said the word spy more than once, but even I couldn't believe it of her. When the opportunity came for me to take the pouch bag, I grabbed both the chance and the bag. Ironic, isn't it? I'm the thief, yet I mistrust her deeply, and I know something's not right. I vow that tomorrow, during safer hours, I'll go to the river where I threw the pouch and will find it. Firstly, I need to know what was in it. Secondly, I also think I need to return it to Marina because I can't let my personal dislikes turn me into a person I've never been and I've never been either vengeful or dishonest. 
In the morning, before most of the country was awake and before the end of unofficial curfew, I walked alone down to the river. My body shook with every step, and the back of my head began to sweat as soon as I left the house. I needed to return to the exact place where I'd disposed of the pouch. How I wished I'd checked its contents before I'd thrown it in, and I still can't believe I didn't. That was one of the reasons I stole it, surely. On the plus side, the pouch was small but heavy, so I guessed there was a good chance it would still be nearby. It wouldn't have been carried far by the water, and perhaps if I was lucky, the laces fastening it might have become tangled on the sharp edge of a rock, anchoring it to the riverbed. As I moved closer to the bank, the far distant shooting echoed around the river valley, and I cringed as I realised it was coming nearer, though fortunately there wasn't any of the shouting which usually signals a nearby attack. I reckon I was safe for a little while at least. Drying my hands lightly on my coat sleeves and trudging my welly-bound feet back onto the river bank, I sat a little further up, where the trees shelter and the wind isn't as intense. I was so close to home that I could almost hear Max snoring, but I felt in a different world entirely when I emptied that green pouch onto my hand. There was one item in the pouch bag. A stone. Heavy for its size, it was of a colour I couldn't quite describe. Blacky, purpley, greeny, browny, silver. It was unusual the way it kept changing second by second. It was Rowena's, not mine. I guessed it was valuable, and I'd taken some personal risks to find it. But even so, I couldn't bear to hold it. The stone moved too much, as if it was contaminated or possessed. It was wrong, and I felt wrong. I threw the stone back into the water and covered it with others. It would be virtually impossible to find now unless the bottom of the river was dredged. I felt a little uneasy, especially about the bag, so I threw that in too, hoping that the water would carry it far away. I arrived home again quickly. Max was in the kitchen, still sleepy in dressing gown and slippers, and asked angrily where I had been and why I hadn't told him I was leaving the house. Of course nobody likes their loved ones being out and about in a war zone, but I couldn't tell him the truth, so lied and said I'd been feeling unwell and needed some air. Even this germ-laden, war-filled air was better than the lung-clogging, stuck-inside-a-house feeling. He agreed. I said nothing to anyone about the pouch, though, or the stone inside. I'd realised I'd stolen the pouch for revenge and to see if it protected me as it seemed to protect her. But that meant there was little to divide us. I was as bad as her with all her stupidity and pettiness. I cringed inwardly. What the hell had I done? I had to get that stone back. Either that or confess to her. Preferably both. I rushed out again, Max shouting behind me, desperate for me to return to the protection of our home and to explain my actions, but seemingly unable to leave it himself, even to protect me. For the next three hours I braved the freezing water of the river and had to reluctantly conclude that both pouch and stone were gone. There was nothing for it. I had to see Rowena. I had to call at the awful woman's house and confess what I'd done. As I walked I felt a pulsating in my pocket. The stone? But how? It glowed a silvery black and seemed to tell me, I belong to you, I protect you. My stone. Not Rowena's. My stone. A greeny-black swirl appeared from nowhere on my head, and I turned to go back home. <laughs>